So Lee Zeldin, uh, you've only got uh, a few weeks to go. How does it feel? Home stretch. I mean, it's so important to get out the vote. There are people all throughout this entire state. They understand the stakes. You need to do everything in your power everywhere. That's not just a message to people internally with our campaign team. It's for all New Yorkers, regardless of whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent. As New Yorkers, we need to take control of our future as a state. I, mean, I really feel like this is a campaign to save our state. We feel good. Uh, the issues are on our side. People are concerned about rising crime, higher costs. Uh, they feel like the state's heading in the wrong direction. Kathy Hochul's in overhead. She's not doing a good job. She's been corrupt the way that she has been engaging in these pay-to-play scandals to provide tens of millions of dollars worth of contributions to her campaign account. And she has shown us every single day that she is not the person for this job. So we have a clear sense of purpose. We have a full tank of energy. We're in the home stretch. We just need everyone everywhere doing everything in their power to help. It's been a pretty mean campaign coming from the Hochul camp. Uh, has that affected you and your family? We've been through the, the ringer over the course of the years. We've been through campaigns in the past. Uh, the family's strong. There's really no insult that can be hurled at me that would hurt my feelings. Uh, the fact is everything's been said through the years and we know that we're right. We know we're right on the issues. I mean, when we see a story as what just happened where a woman in the Buffalo area was murdered by her husband, where a day earlier the guy was released on cashless bail. If there was a standard where judges were able to weigh dangerousness, that guy would have been kept detained. But because Kathy Hochul refuses to allow judges to weigh dangerousness in those cases, he's released back out on the street on a Tuesday, and on Wednesday his wife is dead, murdered in front of his three kids murdered in front of her three kids, and now they're going to be raised without a mother because of cashless bail. So, listen, we're just going to continue to focus on these issues. Is crime the number one issue? For so many New Yorkers, crime is the number one issue. I come across New Yorkers who uh, will talk about the economy and inflation, uh, about the lack of economic opportunity here in New York. They'll talk about rising costs, rising energy costs. New York has a ban in place where they don't allow the safe extraction of natural gas. That ban should be reversed. I'll hear from that fired healthcare worker who lost her job because of Kathy Hochul's COVID vaccine mandate. For her, that's the most important issue, and she knows that on day one, I would reverse that. I believe, in my opinion, everyone who got fired should get their jobs back with back pay. I'll talk to a parent, as I just did with a bunch of uh, women in New York City, part of our Moms for Zeldin Coalition, they're focused on education. They want to ensure that their son, daughter has access to a quality education. Uh, we come across these parents where their kids are stuck in multi-generational poverty. We have poor performing public schools. We should lift the cap on charter schools. So I would say as I travel around, there are voters who tell me about other issues, but overall, Crime in the economy is what I'm hearing all across New York as their top issues. So what would you do, top three things for crime, to fix crime? Well, I believe that we need to roll back the pro-criminal laws. We need to hold DAs accountable who are refusing to enforce the law. And we need to unapologetically back our men and women in blue. Rolling back the pro-criminal laws is about giving judges discretion away dangerousness when setting bail. Rolling back the HALT Act because our correctional officers are being assaulted. I believe that if you're a DA who refuses to do your job, if you're refusing to enforce the law, where we don't have recall in this state, the governor's job constitutionally is to remove that DA who refuses to enforce the law. So, so is that what you'll do? I have pledged my first act, the first day that I'm in office, is turning to the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg to notify him that he is being fired. And also we've seen the attacks on our men and women in law enforcement, New York City going after qualified immunity. Now the same type of politicians who are running Albany want to get rid of qualified immunity statewide. I was raised in a law enforcement household. My running mate, our state's next Lieutenant Governor, Allison Esposito, she was most recently commanding officer of the 70th precinct in Brooklyn, nearly 25 years with the NYPD. We are a ticket. We are a team focused on backing these men and women who will give up their lives in defense of strangers. Uh, so I believe that these three prongs of this approach are key to make sure that we're able to take back our streets. So, but how can you do that when Albany is the problem? Well, that's why we're in this race, because Kathy Hochul needs to be fired. The governor is a 
powerful position in Albany. And I believe that this governor is squandering this opportunity to be leading. I say let's repeal cashless bail. Kathy Hochul says there's no data. You have to elect her to find out where she may stand on this issue in January. That's her position. I say that Alvin Bragg should go. He says he just got there. Cut him some slack. He's doing his job. So the, the power of the soapbox, what you can do with executive orders, executive decisions, what you can do legislatively and power with the budget and beyond, uh, I believe that there's an incredible opportunity here to restore balance and common sense to Albany. And do you hope the legislature will be with you? The legislature should be with the people of New York. Uh, this isn't about the legislature serving the governor. This isn't about the legislature serving a particular party. Uh, this isn't about the legislature serving themselves. And I believe that the will of the people is demanding these changes that we're talking about. It's the will of the people wanting to see cashless bail overhauled. It's the will of the people wanting DAs to actually be doing their job to drive down energy costs to allow the people of the southern tier to be able to tap into this resource. Uh, I believe that the legislature needs to be with the people of New York. And by the way, that's not just about the people of your own district. It's important to remember where you come from, but it's also important to remember what state you come from. And we need to ensure that all New Yorkers of all counties, all regions, all parties, all feel like they have a voice and representation inside of that state legislature. And right now, most New Yorkers feel left out. And do you feel, uh, you know, you'd be the first governor from the Republican Party voted in for many years. Do you feel you can appeal across the board uh, to Democrats and independents as well as your own party? Absolutely. As a member of the House of Representatives, Georgetown University and the Luger Center rank all 435 members of the House based on a bipartisanship. They have an annual bipartisan index. The last year that came out, out of 435, I was ranked 19. The year before that, 12. I believe it's important to stand up for what you believe in. It's okay to debate. It's okay to disagree. We shouldn't be trying to silence and censor competing voices and make it seem like they're not allowed to have any First Amendment rights, that they can't have a social media presence. They don't uh, have a voice. But at the end of the day, when we're debating, when we're disagreeing, the common goal should be where common ground can be found, that we chase after it. The mayor of the city of New York, Eric Adams, we disagree on a lot. We serve together in the state senate. It's our job, representing our mutual constituents, to work together to find common ground however possible. I believe a story that will be written in 2023 is how well a Governor Zeldin is working with a Mayor Adams. Does that mean that the job that Governor Zeldin's going to be doing or the job that a Mayor Adams will be doing will be viewed as perfect? Far from it. I mean, there are people who oppose us, who, will, who vote against me, They'll vote against him. But you know what's important at the end of the day is rooting for these people to, to work together. Uh, I believe, and listen, there's a lot of people who will love the positions that we're talking about, that I bring to the table. They believe that I'll be doing a fantastic job. And there'll be people who vote against me. They would vote against me again. They'd probably disagree with me on policies in between. And that's okay. In this state, in this country, we should be encouraging more of that. I'm focused on doing the best job that I possibly can, and that requires us working across party lines to find common ground however we can. So you see yourself as a governor unity, unlike we, President Biden. When you run to be the governor of New York, you run to be the president of the United States, you're running to be the governor of all New Yorkers, you're running to be the president of all Americans. Kathy Hochul has said that I am no longer a New Yorker. She has declared that I need to get on a bus and permanently move to Florida. Why? Because she disagrees with me. Now, what does that say to the millions of other New Yorkers who also agree with me on these issues? Are they supposed to just leave the state permanently as well? Are you saying that they are no longer New Yorkers either? Uh, I'm not sending a message that Kathy Hochul is no longer a New Yorker. I'm not demanding that she leave the state. I'm just running against her so that she leaves the governor's mansion. And I'm running to restore balance to Albany. But she can stay, her supporters can stay. And by the way, we all can work together to save this state. But this idea that New Yorkers are not your constituents, they are your apostles, her word, not mine. The idea that the governor of New York is the mother of all of New York's 62 counties. I would never 
have that thought come to my mind, referring to myself as the father of New York's 62 counties. She actually said it out loud at a New York State Association of Counties meeting. So it's a very different approach to this position. Uh, New Yorkers want to be in charge of their government, not have the government be looking to rule them like we don't want an emperor or governor in charge of our lives. I believe that public service is about serving the public. Kathy Hochul believes that public service is about being served by the public. I'm in his campaign to save our state. Kathy Hochul's in his campaign to save Kathy Hochul. The contrast couldn't be starker. And what does that tell you about Kathy Hochul and what sort of person she is? Uh, I find her to be a very weak governor. She uh, is somebody who came into office August of 2021 and uh, said that she needed to raise tens of millions of dollars. She decided that the only way that she'd be able to raise tens of millions of dollars is to sell out access to the state capitol. We saw it with this digital gadgets deal. This top donor, the family donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to her. They did a fundraiser for her. Four days after the fundraiser, Kathy Hochul suspends unilaterally without the New York legislature's permission. She suspends New York's competitive bidding law. What does she do next? Well, Digital Gadgets makes her an offer for COVID tests they don't even make. They say, we'll give you these COVID tests and a price tag that ended up being over 600 million, a price tag that ended up being nearly twice the price of what California was paying because California went directly to the supplier and in a no bid contract accepted the same exact day that the offer was made, Kathy Hochul said yes. And now it's been estimated that that has been a hit to taxpayers of an extra over quarter billion dollars that they wouldn't have had to pay. This isn't, this hasn't been the only pay to play scandal. There's been many. Oh, she's totally corrupt. I mean, she, she has shown it with the digital gadgets deal. She showed it with the Medicaid transportation contract worth multiple billions of dollars right after that person hosted a fundraiser for her. And by the way, there's a prohibited period where that bidder is unable to meet with her office. They met anyway. You saw it with the Buffalo Bills stadium deal. Her husband is the general counsel for the company that operates the concessions at Bills stadium. And the way that it was done in the 11th hour, dropping this deal right as the budget was getting finalized, ended up delaying the budget on top of it. So Kathy, what will you do to, to reassure people that you won't be doing the same? A few things. One, Kathy Hochul has accepted these campaign contributions from political appointees and spouses. I wouldn't do that. I would expand the state executive order to make sure that no political appointees, no spouses of political appointees are even donating to the governor. Uh, I won't be taking these donor meetings with people who are trying to get business from the state. Kathy Hochul takes these one-on-one -on -one meetings with these people. It's, it's just a bad idea. You have to separate the two. And she likes to put out a statement saying that one thing has nothing to do with the other. But listen, it just reeks when you look at the facts of that digital gadget deal. I would not have done that. And by the way, if that offer was being made to me in the state, I would want to know, can I get a better deal for New York's taxpayers? Can you get us a better deal? Would I get a better deal if I just went directly to the company that makes the COVID tests? And what would I have found? I would have saved a fortune. But Kathy Hochul wanted to throw a bone to a donor. That's what this is about. This doesn't pass any smell test. And the more and more digging that's being done on it, the more corruption that we're finding in the facts behind it. And do you have a favorite Democrat of all the ones you've met and know? I would say that, uh, you know, I get along with a lot of Democrats. I don't know if I necessarily have had a single favorite. I would say in the House of Representatives, I worked well with Josh Gottheimer of New Jersey. Um, we have shared common ground on some key issues. Uh, it's good to see him fighting congestion pricing right now. Uh, congestion pricing is a terrible idea. New Yorkers struggling to make ends meet, uh, already paying a lot to get into the city gasoline prices are up. There are a paying tolls, fees to be able to get into the city parking once they get in. And now you want to slap him with a congestion pricing fee on top of it. So I think it's good to see Josh out there on it. Uh, he's been vocal in fighting anti-Semitism in the House of Representatives. Uh, he has been willing to stand up to his own party uh, on some of the attacks on Jews and on uh, a, a nation that we are greatly aligned with. 
in Israel. Uh, there are others who I work with. There are plenty of Democrats who I get along with. But I probably have worked with Josh the most. I want to ask you about migration and then the economy. Um, Eric Adams is calling a state of emergency in New York over uh, illegal migrants and blaming Greg Abbott. Um, what would you do to, to stop this illegal migration problem? Well, not only sh should there be a state of emergency in a city, but there should be a state of emergency in a the state, there should be a state of emergency in the country. This shouldn't be something that you see a red state and, or blue state governor, or red state or blue state mayor battling each other. The fact is, is that they all can get totally on the same page. They can work it all out today and it solves nothing. We still have more of a problem tomorrow because while they spend their entire day trying to get on the same page, more people are coming across and more things like fentanyl are coming across. Now you heard silence from some of these elected officials when the flights were coming in. They're coming into Westchester, then they're coming to Stewart, coming into Montgomery Airport, crickets. What you should have seen is that the governor of the state of New York wanting to know who's coming, where are they coming from, where are they going. New Yorkers want transparency, they were demanding it. You have a president of your own party. You don't then say, well, I'm not gonna say anything about it because I don't wanna jam them up because you're not elected to serve the president. You're elected to serve your own people. And in serving your own people, you call on Joe Biden to do these five things to start. President Biden, and he'll pick up the phone. He might not remember what you're telling him, so make sure someone else is there to take notes. Finish construction of the border wall. End catch and release. Enforce the Remain in Mexico policy. Support our customs and border patrol agents. Stop incentivizing and rewarding illegal entry. That's what I'm saying now. That's what I'd be saying as governor. And I would be demanding to know who's coming, where they're coming from, and where are they going. And could you stop them? Can you stop them flying in? To whatever power I am told that I possibly have to stop uh, these flights. And by the way, I, I see these buses that are coming in. And I get asked about the buses. Do we want the buses and the flights to be coming into New York? No. But let's be honest in this conversation. The reason why those buses are coming to New York is because you have border communities that are desperate. They feel like they are out of options. They don't know what else to do. So if the people in Martha's Vineyard uh, are losing their minds because 50 people show up in Martha's Vineyard, the most tolerant people in the entire planet who are enjoying their summers at Martha, Martha's Vineyard are finding a way to make sure that they are removed from the borders of Martha's Vineyard by sundown. Imagine what is happening every single day at the border. So don't be a hypocrite, don't be a double standard, uh, don't be shown the double standard by losing your mind over what's happening at Martha's Vineyard. If you're not going to show any understanding, any type of sensitivity to the reality on the ground right now at the border. Uh, and I feel like the answer is really a state of emergency for the country where it's all hands on deck to be able to secure our southern border of people coming illegally and also things. Mm. And now with the economy, uh, how, how would you fix the economy? I know you talk about taxes. I believe that taxes should be cut across the board. I believe the estate tax in New York should be eliminated. I'm someone who, quite frankly, would be in favor of there not being an income tax, but even if there was a lower income tax to 3% or 4%, that would be progress. Now, it's also important to bring spending under control. Over the last three years or so, tens of billions of dollars have been added to the New York State budget. We get these one-shots that get sent from the federal government. Does the state government use that money to pay off the principal owed? on their unemployment insurance loan they took from the federal government? No, they view it as more money for their pet projects. What's the consequence of it? Well, New York's employers get slapped with a letter that they weren't expecting from the Department of Labor saying that at the beginning of September, you all are going to have to pay a fee on this principal that's owed. We have to bring spending under control in the state and there's many ways to do it. We need to bring down energy costs, allowing the safe extraction of natural gas helps bring down energy costs. Approving new pipeline applications that are being delayed and denied in Albany that instead should be getting approved. 
By doing that, it creates jobs, it generates revenue, it brings down energy costs, it allows us to revitalize communities. And if you think about this uh, push in New York, trying to emulate California in some of the worst ways, saying that they want to get rid of all gas vehicles by 2035, what happens when, like we just witnessed down in Florida, they lose power? Play that out. I mean, our grid right now is not in a place to sustain what they're pushing, and it's not on pace to sustain by 2035 what, what they're pushing. Yeah. I'm an all of the above uh, energy person. Uh, I believe that uh, it was uh, it, it is a way to provide energy that is not easily replaced. When you make a decision to close down Indian Point, to try to make up for that really creates a big issue. When uh, you know, on top of the nuclear with, uh, with natural gas, Williams Pipeline was gonna come into the New York uh, City area and Bill de Blasio and his friends all stopped the Williams Pipeline. So what happens next? National Grid and Con Ed say no gas hookups for new construction. What happens after that? The New York City Council passes a new law saying no gas hookups for new construction. Now, the same type of politicians controlling Albany, they want to do this statewide. No gas hookups for new construction. I was just in the southern tier a couple weeks ago. I was at Ann's Pancakes. I did a meet and greet where a whole lot of people showed up hungry. They wanted their pancakes. Here's the problem. When we walked in, the electric was out. The good news was everybody still got their pancakes. Why? Because they don't just operate on electric. They were able to cook the food using gas. So I believe that whether you want, if you want to put a solar panel on your home, go put a solar panel, panel on your home. You know, you own a farm, you want to throw up a windmill, God bless you, go throw up a windmill. Uh, but the idea that we are going to eliminate choice and be going after natural gas, to be going after nuclear and some of these other forms uh, is a bad decision. Let's continue to pursue new technology. Let's continue to find ways to be more environmentally efficient. By the way, what you find is oftentimes you're more economically efficient. We saw that on Long Island. The new Caithness plant was put up years back. We had these outdated uh, plants that were operating across Long Island that were basically being propped up to pay, help pay property taxes to the local school district. Uh, there are jobs that are at stake and that's important. We want to keep people employed. Caithness operates more environmentally friendly and more economically efficient too. People are able to save money. So the pursuit of new technologies are something that Republicans, conservatives greatly embrace. We support conservation. Uh, you go out there and have a conversation with uh, sportsmen, hunters, fishermen, Republicans, conservatives, uh, but the idea that you're going to tell everybody who's out there, you are not allowed to hook up to gas. Well, now you're violating a core principle of ours. We're all for pursuing uh, a better technology, but not eliminating choice. So t tell us now about the attack in Rochester in July. Um, just talk me through how, because you were very um, quick, uh, you almost like muscle memory, you managed to, to um, neutralize him pretty quickly. Just talk us through that. We were starting a 14 rally, 14 county swing. It was our uh, first rally taking place in the Rochester area in Monroe County. And uh, great crowd, beautiful night. We're at a VFW and someone comes on stage. And that when I first see his hat saying that he's a veteran, at the same exact time, I'm noticing that he has something on his hands that looked like brass knuckles with a couple of daggers pointing out at it. I wasn't exactly sure what it was, but I noticed something in his hands. And his, when his hands started coming up to me, it was an interesting emotion because he's wearing a hat that says he's a veteran. For me in life, I completely drop my guard. But when two things are happening at once, my guard couldn't possibly be more raised. Now, uh, when I was younger, I did karate. I'm a black belt. Actually once won the world championships in sparring. And it was a bit of muscle memory. Um, when someone comes at you with a sharp object, if they have a knife in their hand or uh, something else that you feel like you have to defend yourself against, 
some people think you have to somehow go after the knife. But actually, if you can, if it's possible, if you can gain control of their wrist, you can then gain control of their knife, uh, of the sharp object, especially when you're in a setting where there's a whole bunch of other people who'd be around who could just tackle the guy. So that's what happened. I mean, as soon as his hand went up, my hand goes up, grabbed his wrist. Moment later, he, got, uh, he gets subdued by a bunch of people who were there. And uh, we were actually able to finish the speech. We continued the rally tour. Security did ramp up. Um, and, you know, as far as the person who did it, I was told that he was intoxicated. Uh, I was told, I, I learned a little bit more about his military service. I learned a little bit more about his personal life. I was told that he has mental health issues. And I know that Monroe County has an amazing veteran service agency and they love their veterans. So uh, I've heard that they have connected. That's good. Hopefully he gets the help that he needs uh, because he clearly seemed like somebody in need of help uh, at that moment. Tell me a little bit about your uh, own military service. The only thing that I knew when I showed up at college was that I wanted to sign up to the ROTC. There were a lot of questions in life as to where you'll go. This is an experience that uh, many of us hit that independent moment in life where uh, you might be going off to college, maybe you're getting your first job. And for me, that's really the one thing I knew. I spent five years in the Army ROTC. It was a four-year program, but it was aligned with college. So I did, I did college in two years and I did law school in three years. So ROTC was spread out over those five years. Commissioned into the Military Intelligence Corps as a second lieutenant. I spent four years on active duty. I switched over from the Military Intelligence Corps to the JAG Corps. I was a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division. Spent some time in Iraq in 2006. Uh, I transitioned to the Reserve in 2007. I still serve to this day. I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the Army Reserve. I'm currently serving in my 20th year. And I absolutely love it. I have loved every bit of my military service. If I had to go back and do it again, I absolutely would sign up again. There's a lot that I do uh, in my role as a member of Congress. There's a lot that I would do in my role as governor of the state of New York that is driven by the values that I learned, the, the teachings that I've encountered through my time in the military. Uh, in the military, around my dog tags, I wore the seven, seven army values and the acronym is leadership. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage. The first time that I put those on around my neck, some of those words didn't mean as much as they eventually would. They had meaning, but it deepened. I lived those values on duty and off duty. Uh, it is important to, while you stick up for what you believe in, that you are conducting yourself in a way that you can live with the rest of your life and be proud of. And, and I know that I've done that. Uh, I'm very proud of my military service. Uh, I'm proud of the values that it taught me, the experience, the people who I met from all across the uh, entire country. Uh, when I went on to active duty, I, had a, I still had an, an accent from New York. Uh, and then you meet people from all over the country. And then when I came back, I didn't really have an accent anymore. And as a matter of fact, every once in a while, I'd catch myself in some southern type of an accent. Uh, and that was just the military following me back home to, to New York. Uh, I learned in the military the word y'all. I learned during my time serving in Congress what the plural of y'all was. thought it might be y'alls, but it's actually all y'all. Uh, so it's continued in Washington, being able to meet people from all across the entire country, different backgrounds. The military provided that service. The best assignment I had in the military was with the 82nd Airborne Division. And they're called the All-Americans, and they, they truly were All-Americans. I was surrounded by the best of the best, and I loved every minute of it. Did you ever jump out of a plane? I did. Jumped oh. out of planes and helicopters. Uh, I, I actually remember the very first time I jumped out of a plane... I was at Fort Stewart, Georgia, and there's 10 of us in our stick, and I was the 10th person, and I get out, and my chute opens, that's good, uh, that's the first test, 
And I look down and I see the other nine people hitting the ground. And I look up and I see the airplane that I jumped out of at elevation. I wasn't going down. And apparently there's just some weird thing with physics where there was a heat pocket in my chute and I'm drifting over trees. This is my first jump out of an airplane. And I was supposed to be now on the ground and here I am going this way at altitude. Uh, and we have these four risers that attach us to our parachute. Uh, and in order to drop the heat pocket, as well as to move in a particular direction, you have to pull down one of the risers. I had to do it three times. Got the heat pocket out, landed on the drop zone, didn't get injured. It was all good. Um, but I was broken into my experience as a paratrooper in a very unique way. And I'll tell you the way it ended. Uh, when I started jumping out of planes, I was single without kids. It makes a lot more sense to jump out of a plane when you're single without kids. When I was married with two kids, uh, I would jump out of a plane and I was thinking about my family. And it was a North Carolina night, beautiful North Carolina night. We're doing a night jump and we had our gear on us, a soft pack that you drop when uh, you're close to the ground. And you know, it's, it might be 10, 20 feet away from you and, and you, it's attached to you so you can track it down even though it's dark. Well, I happened to do a parachute landing fall that night that went backwards. Basically, the way you land is, you know, it's decided for you. If you're going backwards, you're doing a rear parachute landing fall. You're not going to, do, to go forward or sideways. And I fall backwards and my head hits my pack. And again, the pack was soft, so it was like a pillow. And I'm landing on my back and I'm looking up at the sky. It was this beautiful night. And I said to myself, I am never going to jump out of an airplane ever again. I said, uh, I got through my entire experience without getting injured. Uh, I saw plenty of other injuries. There were people at times who wouldn't survive, which is extremely rare. Uh, but there were a lot of people who got severely injured and I was just happy with my uh, experience as a paratrooper. Um, really grateful for that, that experience. I'll tell you, it's very unnatural when you're, um, you're, you're in a helicopter, you go up to altitude, the jump master taps you on the back of the head. You know, you, you're inclined to maybe say, hey, why are you hitting me? But instead, you say, okay, and then you just push yourself off the side of the helicopter. Uh, but it requires you to be much, much younger in life. Um, when I first got to Fort Bragg, I was uh, with this guy, Winston Williams, a fellow captain, and we'd go every Sunday morning to Cracker Barrel. And that's how our Sundays would start. One of us would call the other, we'd say Cracker Barrel, Cracker Barrel. And then we go 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and then we go meet at Cracker Barrel. Um, two and a half years later, when I'm leaving Fort Bragg, we were still, every Sunday, going to Cracker Barrel, except he was now married with one kid. I was now married with two kids. So instead of going to Cracker Barrel and asking for a table of two, we're asking for a table of seven. And I'll tell you, priorities in life change once you have kids. So tell us about, um, you were over in Iraq um, on deployment when you got the call that your wife had gone into early labor. Tell us about that. It was actually a Red Cross message uh, that our unit received saying that Diana had went to her labor in her 22nd week. There was concern that the babies were not going to make it. And my commander told me that he was sending me back for what was essentially a funeral. It was, I, the order that sent me back was for maybe seven or 10 days. I don't remember exactly the, the time length. And I remember talking to the XO of the battalion and saying, he just doesn't, I, I don't want to leave. In a way, you know, it's just, I, I felt guilty even going back for a few days. And he said, and he had kids and he was married. He said, actually, you should feel terrible if you don't. And he says that they are telling me that I am going back. It wasn't even like they were asking for my opinion. Uh, and they had me on a helicopter out, went back home. My gear was stayed. I was only going back for a few days. My wife checked into the right hospital. It was the NICU at Georgetown University. They kept the babies in her for three more weeks and they were born in the 25th week. And it was a they. And originally uh, we thought it was going to be one kid. And I had a scheduled sonogram uh, call with Diana where she was going to tell me the sex of our one child. I was deployed with an all male infantry battalion. There was 469 of us, three women. 
So I'm with the guys and testosterone level couldn't possibly be any higher. You're in Iraq on a combo, combat deployment with the 82nd Airborne. So is it gonna be a boy or a girl? And I told him, it's gonna be a boy, I guarantee it. I don't even produce the X chromosome. <laughs> and God has his ways. If you uh, try to uh, outsmart the, the system, if you try to outsmart faith, I get on the phone, Diana tells me the news, it's not only a girl, it's two girls. So I go back to the guys and they're like, so is it a boy? Uh, they were giving me a hard time when I told them that it was actually these two girls. When they were born, it was a rough go. Uh, they were born way early. They were a pound and a half. They went through a lot, a lot of surgeries. Uh, Michaela especially uh, went through an awful lot. Uh, it was a very personal experience for Diane and I. And because of the power of prayer, the miracles of modern medicine and their will to live. And they just turned 16. They're in 11th grade right now. They're doing great. They're in, um, you know, they're AP classes, they're getting good grades. Did you think really you were going to lose them? Yeah, so the first couple of weeks uh, or so, th both of the girls had intestinal surgery and lung surgery. And it was a tough go at it, but it became very frightening for Michaela especially. When she was about two weeks old, she was two pounds and she was carrying an extra pound of fluid. So it, it didn't look normal. This is not like any other baby anyone has ever seen in life. She went to septic shock, which has an 80 to 90% mortality rate. And while she was in septic shock, she had a stroke. The doctors sat Diane and I down to talk us through it and give us their recommendation, suggesting that we let Michaela go. Now here's the thing, Michaela for the last 24 hours up until this conversation wasn't getting any better, but she wasn't getting any worse. She was fighting. So she's gonna fight, we're gonna fight too. So we're asking the doctor, well, what are our options? One of the options was to do this very risky brain surgery. Diane and I went up to Michaela's incubator, we said goodbye, certainly fearing the worst. I mean, it was, it was a really bad situation and uh, it was hard to be uh, too optimistic. You could be hopeful, but it was hard to be too optimistic. We say goodbye, we go back to the waiting room, doctors come out after surgery. And they say, good news, Michaela's not out of the woods, but things went better than expected. I remember Diane and I high-fiving each other, we were so excited. And uh, it was a long road still. Both the girls came home with heart monitors, both of them came home with a dozen medications each. Michaela had to go through early intervention not only did Michaela go through life where there was no long-term um, effects like they said, there was, there was no cerebral palsy. She was able to see, she was able to walk, she was able to talk. There actually hasn't been any long-term effects of what she went through at all. And so does your faith uh, inform the way you felt about what happened? Did it strengthen I, your faith? I will tell you that beyond my own faith, there were prayers coming in from probably 16 different religions. Mm -hmm. And every time anybody from any religion told me that they were praying for me, they were praying for our family, they were praying for Michaela, they are praying for Ariana, I took it. Uh, there's certainly moments in life where faith deepens for individuals and it's as personal as it gets for that person, for that family, for my family, that absolutely was a point where faith deepened very much. And you're Jewish and your wife is brought up in the Mormon faith. What, how do you resolve that? Somehow it has totally worked. Uh, it's been amazing. My, uh, my daughters had a you know, benot mitzvah, they went through Hebrew school, they have family that celebrates Hanukkah, they have family that celebrates Christmas, works out for them, you know, double the, the presents. Uh, I actually do remember growing up and I've shared some of this strategy with my daughters along the way. I had some in my family who celebrated Christmas. My birth birthday was a month later. So the new Nintendo would come out. I could get the Nintendo for Hanukkah. I could get all the games for Christmas. And then for my birthday, I could get, you know, the guns, the power pad and all the other goodies. So you end up with the whole system 
through the whole process. So uh, I, I think that somehow it's just really worked out for my daughters. By the way, they have been exposed to many religions. They come around with me to events where they've interacted with the Sikh community here on Long Island. And that list goes on of, uh, of so many who maybe if I wasn't serving in Congress, if I wasn't running for governor, they would have never had those encounters that better inform them. And what about your views on abortion? Did they alter it at all, <coughs> having this experience of such young babies? Well, I'll tell you, I did have an opportunity to see life in the second trimester, and it was beautiful. Thank God these girls had the opportunity to be born, to survive, to thrive, uh, and they're doing great. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that while I'm pro-life, the way that uh, Kathy Hochul has been talking about this issue has been so fundamentally to its core dishonest and disingenuous. Because the reality in New York from the law standpoint is that a few years ago, New York codified far more than Roe to the end of the ninth month. And there's a less than 0% chance that Carl Hasty, the Speaker of the Assembly and the Assembly Democrats are sending me a bill to roll that law back. It's not why I got in this race. It's not something that I will do when I'm serving as governor. I am pro-life, but that law is not changing. Now, Donald Trump, you were a big supporter of his and a great help to him during the impeachment. Um, has he been a help or a hindrance in terms of winning New York over? Uh, he, he's been helpful. Uh, we, we had, we've had successful events together. Uh, there are a lot of people in New York who he remains uh, very popular with. There's many other New Yorkers who didn't support him. They didn't vote for him. They wouldn't vote for him again. New York is a diverse place. There are people who love Donald Trump and there are people who don't love Donald Trump. When I first started running, people would ask me for Congress. People would ask me, are you a John Boehner Republican or a Tea Party Republican? Two years later, are you a Ted Cruz Republican or a Pete King Republican? I started this campaign, people would ask me, are you gonna be a Charlie Baker Republican or a Ron DeSantis Republican? Somewhere along the way, people realize that I'm my own man. I have my own beliefs. I will work with anyone to find common ground however possible. I will tell you as a member of Congress, serving with a President Trump, when it's combating MS-13 gang violence on Long Island, it's getting important Army Corps projects that we needed here, because this congressional district is almost completely surrounded by water. The electron ion collider that's coming to Brookhaven National Lab, the Abraham Accords, moving the embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. This list goes on of so many different ways that we were able to work closely together on. And I'll tell you, when we talk about issues related to New York, we're talking about rising crime. We're talking about ways to bring down the cost of living in New York, how to bring down energy costs. If you get into a conversation with Donald Trump about what needs to get fixed about policy in New York, he has ideas on fighting crime and improving the business climate and creating more jobs that quite frankly are much sounder than what you see from people up in Albany who have outsized power who self-describe as socialists. So uh, I've been talking to some people who are Democrats from Queens who say that they're going to vote for you. Um, because they're so sick of the crime and so on. But they did try and call your office and, uh, and, and to volunteer a few times and got no answer. Yeah. Are, you, are, are you happy with the sort of support that you've got from the party and, and with your campaign structure? First off, I want their names yeah. so, that we can, uh, so we can call them back. Yeah. Um, we, we rely on volunteers, uh, very much so. So uh, anybody who contacted our team looking to, to volunteer, we want to get all of them involved. Um, <clears throat> all of our campaigns heavily rely on grassroots. It relies on $5 donations. Sometimes the $5 donation comes with a four-page letter. You read that four-page letter and you realize that that $5 donation comes with 20 votes, maybe 50 votes. That's a person who is all in and do everything that they can to help you. Uh, we have gotten a lot of support uh, around this state. There are some very strong Republican committees in particular counties 
There are other counties where the Republican committee is growing. We've had uh, many changes of leadership at the county chair level over the course of the last couple of weeks. Many uh, Republican committee chairs have been replaced with new chairs and hopefully they bring their ideas, their energy, they build up their, their committee, they get more committee members, they get folks engaged in these races. Local races matter. This state race is very important. So they have an opportunity right here out of the gate in their first few weeks as chairs to build up their committee. The fundraising has been good. We just reported uh, our latest fundraising report, $19.6 million raised since we got into this campaign uh, just over a year and a half ago. Um, we have millions of dollars right now to continue getting our TV ads out. We'll keep raising money. <coughs> we'll keep recruiting new uh, donors. We're all in and really anyone out there who wants to volunteer, we want to sign everybody up. One last question. Tell us what you would be like as Governor Zeldin. I want to be the governor for all New Yorkers. I want to hit the ground running instantly on day one. First thing I will do the first day I'm in office, as I mentioned earlier, is telling the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg that he's going to be fired. He's going to send a message to other DAs. The DA stands for De uh, District Attorney. It doesn't stand for Defense Attorney. Uh, it's going to send a message to law enforcement. It's going to send a message to law-abiding New Yorkers. The second thing is that all COVID mandates in the state of New York that I have the power to get rid of need to go. That's day one, act two. Day one, action three, is appointing a special prosecutor to investigate the deadly nursing home order and cover up. If no wrongdoing is found, hey, that's great. But there are thousands of New York families who know that wrongdoing took place and they want accountability, they want justice, and they're not gonna rest until they get it. There's another part of that third action that first day, and that's also completing a thorough COVID investigation from the administrative side. If any wrongdoing is found, it gets referred to the criminal justice side. I wanna know everything that happened, good, bad, indifferent, what lessons learned that worked, that we need to do again if another uh, communicable disease or natural disaster or some other emergency strikes, what didn't work? Kathy Hochul came into office and she was guaranteeing that she was going to do this thorough investigation. She promised it to the faces of these people who lost their loved ones and it still hasn't kicked off. The last announcement that I'm aware of was an announcement by the governor saying that there will be no findings whatsoever until after the November 8th election. This is all political. They don't want to know what they need to do better. They don't want the bad news. They'd rather just cover it all up. So that's the second part of Act 3. The fourth action, my first day, is recognizing something that shouldn't have to be recognized, but we'll do it anyway. Parents have a fundamental right to control the upbringing of their child, and they do not relinquish that right by sending their kids off to school. We need to ensure that parents are as involved as possible in the kid's education, and quite frankly, the best thing for a child's upbringing is for a family unit to be as strong as possible. So we have all sorts of ideas, these and many more, for a very busy first day. I want people to go to sleep on election night, on November 8th, and sigh just a sense of relief knowing that the state is heading in the right direction. I want to feel, I want them to feel it when they go to sleep at the end of our first day as governor. And as they are watching the first budget going through, that first session being completed, that they say, you know what, New York's back on track. New York is reopened for business. We are restoring New York to glory. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You got it. Thank you.